This podcast was proudly sponsored by LJ Kidd, a fellow dyslexic. LJ is an Australian children's author and illustrator. She was one of our 2018 podcast interviewees. So to find out more about her story, head to deardyslexic.com and listen to her podcast, which is episode 13. It's always so wonderful to talk to a fellow dyslexic, and this podcast is certainly no exception. Today, I'm speaking with Amanda Harrison, who is an experienced pilot with a demonstrated history of working in the aviation industry. In May 2019, Amanda paid tribute to Amy Johnson, who is a true aviation hero. By flying in her footsteps, attempting to fly solo from London, UK, through to Darwin in Australia. She was flying in her vintage Tiger Moth. It was her first major adventure since being diagnosed with breast cancer in 2017, which meant she had to have treatments, surgeries, but most importantly, in 2018, time to heal. I really enjoyed chatting with Amanda. Let's listen to her courageous story. So thank you so much for coming on the show uh, this evening, your morning, Amanda. Hello, Shay. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. How are you going over in lovely England? <laughs> it's a it's a very strange time for everybody, isn't it? It's um, and of course for pilots, we're all a bit ground fever because we're normally in the in the sky, and the and the weather has been absolutely beautiful. So I I think there's somebody up there sort of um, looking down on us and laughing. But yes, it um, and at the moment I'm well, and at the moment my family is all well, which is the most important thing. That's good to hear in this uh, crazy world that we're currently living in at the moment. We've been yes. lucky to have beautiful weather too, actually. So we've been able to at least get outside and have our, our bit of exercise we're allowed to have at the moment. But, um, and, and of course, you, you've, you've had quite, um, you know, it, it, you've had all those devastating fires and everything, haven't you? So this is just um, on top of everything to sort of devastate the economy and, and all kinds of things over there. Yes, we've had... Uh, fires, floods, and now this. So it has not been the best start to the year for for any of our fellow Australians. But um, everyone seems to be doing pretty well, considering. And I think we're really lucky to have a government that's um, able to financially support so many people during this time. Yes, I've been following you for quite a while now on social media, and all the amazing achievements you've um, under accomplished. I should say, over the last couple of years. <laughs> um, from flying uh, from Australia, from England to Australia, which is a massive um, accomplishment, which I can't wait to talk to you about, and also um, surviving cancer as well. So it's so great to hear that you're um, feeling well at the moment. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and um, your journey to get into the aviation industry and then to fly from England to Australia? in 2019 <laughs> yes um, I didn't get to Australia I got to Beirut but my plan was to get all the way to Australia and I'll be doing a second attempt at some point um, before I die as everybody says um, uh, barring things like coronavirus happening um, I started off life very normally um, normal family my dad is was an amazing person and he's the person that I have all the, where I get my enthusiasm from. He never lost his love for learning. And when I look back at it, he was probably where I got the dyslexia from. And also my granddad was left-handed and he had problems uh, reading and writing. So I probably got it from him as well. But my dad was this amazing person that would be enthusiastic about so many things. And aviation was his love. He was an engineer by trade but he built remote control models and my earliest memories of being dragged around soggy fields picking up bits of crashed models as they as his beautiful model that he'd spent months making took about 12 seconds to crash spectacularly into the ground and we were sent round picking up the bits and the famous words of don't tell your mother this came out (laughs) Um, but this is where I got my love for um, flying and I took my first, I had my first flight at the age of 14 when we were on holiday. And as I lifted off from the ground, it's, it, it, the only way to describe it is 
what is what is your passion so if your passion is singing or cooking or doing you know anything else then that's what my passion was I left the ground and suddenly I felt like I belonged in the air and that was that was when I thought how on earth do I do this as a living which took then a huge amount of time afterwards but going back a little bit um, I was discovered as dyslexia when I was in primary school I was having a very very horrible time in primary school the teacher was bullying me never mind about the kids bullying me and they all thought he he didn't believe in anything like that and my mum we didn't even know dyslexia existed at that point and there was a fantastic lady uh, Pauline Croxall we went along to listen to uh, one of her sort of talks to to show about dyslexia and my mum went that's it and I was tested and I was found that I was dyslexic and had high intelligence you, you sort of meander around for a bit don't you when you're first knowing that you're dyslexic so then mm. I had the advantage of going through secondary school with being tested um, or the advantage or disadvantage it, it, you look back and you think there's good and bad things and it wasn't until I actually got to college that I really started to love learning uh, my mum and dad helped me learn to read and I um, fell in love with reading old-fashioned novel books that were yellow paper because of course white on black is often very difficult for dyslexics to read so I then found a love of learning and that's then what sort of grew me more and I suddenly realized there was life outside of school and there was life outside of being this as as people want to call you this thick dyslexic and actually dyslexia has abilities rather more than disabilities which is what I'm now (laughs) on a mission for the rest of my life to do but yeah so I grew up it was as I say, very traditional growing up. I was never going to be a commercial pilot because I didn't have the money, didn't have the intelligence. That's what I thought. I was in a normal job. I was in an office job. Wasn't doing particularly well at it, I must admit, because it was an office job. Always always getting told off for looking out the window and always getting told off for, for laughing and making people laugh. <laughs> um, <laughs> but that's an interesting thing in, in, in this in this situation, people are actually quite happy about that. That job um, just ended a bit like now. It, I, we walked in and we're kind of like, collect your stuff, see you later. I, was, I had learned to fly privately at that point. And at that point, I went and said, oh, I, I'm going to have to give up the flying because I can't afford it. And one of the instructors sat down and, and said, go commercial. And that was it, really. And all I've been doing is doing the next step. So when I found out I was dyslexic, I thought, well, I'll try to do my exams. Uh, then I thought, well, I'll try to do college. Then I thought, oh, well, I'll try to do university. Then I thought, well, I'll try to get my pilot's license. Then I thought, well, I'll try to get my commercial license. And then I thought, well, I'll try to fly to Australia in a tiger <laughs> moss. <laughs> and that's all I do. All I do is just do the next step. But people see it as a big thing. <laughs> I go, yeah. No, I'm just, I'm just doing the next step. And at the moment, the next step is, is finishing the book, uh, The Solo to Darwin, the first attempt, and finishing the documentary solo to die in first attempt but both of those statements if you'd said to me I was going to say those statements years ago I'd be laughing at you so yeah <laughs> it's, so, uh, interesting. it's a bit mandarin you um you you chunked up your life into different <laughs> different uh stages which dyslexic people are supposed to be it's a really good strategy for us if we chunk things you can kind of work yes. through it and break it down then you take the next the next activity yep. you you work yep. at it and break it down so that's amazing how you were able to chunk, but, you know, work towards your goal because that was a big goal. How did yes. you go studying? Is it, it was interesting because I'd like to come back to you about the disability versus the, the ability later on. But how yes. did you go with studying? Did you feel it was a disability then? No, because I did distance learning studying, which I, I often say I don't recommend that to people, but I probably would to a dyslexic because you can learn in your own way. And of course, now with the internet and all the amazing videos that are out there. So videos is one of the things where dyslexics learn really, really quickly and really get the information across, um, where it's all in books when I was studying for my commercial exam. But I was really lucky, again, because my dad took a, long, uh, took a lot of time to help me. My mum was going through breast cancer at that time. Uh, so I was up there looking after my mum with breast cancer and I was studying for my exams as well with my dad and he was helping me. It's that thing of going, don't try and eat, 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 eat the whole thing. You, you, you take it, you take it or, or don't try and climb the mountain all at once. You, you take one step. 
uh, and, and do one little thing and take one step and do one little thing. Uh, so take one, you know, right, say, right, I'm going to read this amount of stuff today. And I have, um, I have a little phrase that's in my uh, course that I call seven o'clock moments. So when I was studying, when my mum was, as I say, going through uh, cancer, I get to seven o'clock in the evening and that would be it. I'd be closing the books and going, I can't do it. I'm, I'm never going to be able to learn this stuff. I can't remember it all. I can't do it. I, I, you know, and it was all, I can't, I can't, I can't. And mum would go, ah, seven o'clock. And I'd go, what are you talking about? And she'd go, it's seven o'clock in the evening. I think it's time to close the books, have something to eat and forget about it. And so one of the things that my big mantra is, allow yourself to give in, but don't ever give up. So when you've reached the point where you can't do it and you can't think about it, that's your seven o'clock moment. And you need to switch off and go, do you know what? I need to give in now for the rest of the day or the rest of the week or the rest of the hour and come back to it when, I'm, when I've got a little bit more um, capacity. I love and that. I think that's I've written what, that down to share yeah. with our community. Yeah, the seven o'clock, and lots of people have different things, but seven o'clock, and and I've told that to loads of people now, and actually they go, oh yeah, and I go, yeah, you're having a seven o'clock moment. <laughs> and, and, and I have to put that it. on my I'm, wall as well when I'm throwing a little <laughs> tantrum that I can't do this anymore. <laughs> well, I'm having a lot of seven o'clock moments <laughs> writing the book at the moment because it's kind of a, I'm dictating it, and then the dictating machine doesn't say what I'm saying. And, and ah, so, interesting, yeah, so, you're dictating so. it. So, I've been speaking to some other uh, dyslexic people lately, and they have some of them have gone through online learning and have said how mm -hmm. wonderful it is, and that's how they got their uh, qualifications as well, a long distance. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. where I've spoken to other people that are dyslexic and they worry because they don't have that face-to-face -face and someone to sit with them and uh, support them if they need it. Did you get any support when you were at university? Any accommodation? Did you declare you were dyslexic, dis disclosed? I did. I declared it all the way through because I was, um, uh, because I found out at school, so I had help through college and I had help through university. In, in university, I had... Uh, quite a lot of help with things like organisation and how I was going to plan my work and how I was going to do that. I had extra time in exams, of course, but I did a lot of um, my degree, strangely enough, was in creative arts. So it wasn't actually a lot of exams. A lot of it was making stuff and producing stuff. Uh, but I did actually do a dissertation. So I suppose that was initially my first book. Mm. But a lot of that was broken down. And again, it's that chunking thing of breaking it down. And there are a lot of online courses out there that do actually offer help one-to-one -one on Skype or Zoom or all of that kind of, um, you know, all the different medias. And a lot of people don't take it up. So you're allowed so many hours to discuss with people. And what I would say is don't take the full hour, break it down and say, can I have 20 minutes or can I have half an hour and discuss one particular problem that I'm worried about so that you're not trying to fit everything into into an hour you're doing mm. smaller chunks because i think dyslexics are better when they do smaller chunks i can often i'll often sit and write something for 20 minutes and do a really good paragraph and then go off and have a cup of tea and then come back if you strap my backside to the chair for a whole five hours i won't be productive and one of the one of the things in my course is learn how you learn so one of the difficult things in our world at the moment is everything is linear. So we have to learn left to right or right to left, whichever way that your written language is, but it's linear. Everything is A, B, C, D. Whereas dyslexics don't learn that way. Dyslexics learn Y, Z, B, E, and then they put it together. And we can often, if you look at dyslexics brain, if you go into the science of it, we can often make a cup of tea in very different ways throughout the day because our brain can actually make a cup of tea in, very, in lots of different ways because it just needs the tools, whereas most people will have to make the cup of tea in exactly the same way. And I know I take it down to basics like making a cup of tea, but when you start to look at how you learn, so I learn visually, I learn through um, connecting with people. One of my biggest things that I cannot learn is when somebody is talking to me. So actually podcasts... I love listening to them and they're great, but often I can go away and not have a clue about what was actually said about it. Mm. 
Mm. So, so I do this in driving instructions. People will say to you, right, it's down the road, turn left, turn right, and then over the roundabout, and then take the next left. And you've lost me on the first left because it's a, a, it, it's a verbal instruction. And my brain doesn't work like that. My brain has to look at a map, which is why it's good at flying. And that is my ability on the flying and the pilot side of things. So one of the things I would say to people is try and figure out how, how you individually as a dyslexic learn. Do you learn visually? Do you learn orderly or, or audio? Or do you learn by physically feeling things? Because you can actually physically make the alphabet and that can get in your brain better. So you need to know how, how you actually best get the information. And as soon as you learn that, that's then, you then put all of your, you then go, right, if I learn visually, then I need YouTube. I need YouTube videos all the time. <laughs> it's, it's sort of one of those little um, sort of tricks. But you yeah. don't get taught that at school and you don't get taught that in the workplace because, of course, in the workplace, you're handed the manual or you're handed the manual on the computer and you know, I've got lots of manuals to read on the computer and I'm kind of like, mm-hmm. how on earth do I do that? You know? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so, and it's funny you say um, yeah. the verbal instruction versus the map because I can't do either. So it's oh. um, how you're able to read maps is uh, really interesting because I used to have to do cadets at school and I couldn't even tell you which way north, south, east or west was, let alone how to read a map. So how do you yeah, navigate but- in the air? <laughs> navigating the air is easier because so you're looking at a compass which is a visual clue you're not having to read uh, signposts you're not having to as you're driving along you're not having to read you're just looking at a visual cue uh northeast southwest sort of thing and you normally go in straight lines you don't have to go roundabouts you don't have to do a left <laughs> turn you don't have to do a right turn you go in straight lines and the and the chart often fits the the chart should fit, fit fit the ground if if you're not lost. Now that's a little bit of a different thing when you're when you're going across the Mediterranean, <laughs> but across water. <laughs> but that's when you just follow the compass and you just follow that uh, follow that line. And of course, Google Earth now is amazing because you can look at Google Earth and that's how you can see charts. But this is where I'm saying about how how you learn because it is true that a lot of women's brains don't operate uh, uh, can't assimilate the charts can't assimilate maps because they have a a more nurturing side of things and i possibly don't have the massive nurturing side of things but have a bigger um capacity to read a map or a chart and again it goes back to actually learning what your what your strengths are and concentrating on those rather than trying to do your weaknesses. So your strength is the fact that you've put people together. You've built this amazing thing where people can access where to get information and how to help themselves. So your, your, I would say your thing is connection. You can connect to people and you can talk very articulately. And therefore that is one of your biggest strengths. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't, worry that you, that you can't that do I can't any read a map <laughs> yeah well, I, well, I wouldn't worry about that because... no thank god for google maps and every i talk about it a lot on these podcasts because i and i still struggle with google maps because when it tells you you're there i still can't find where that is i know i'm really close to the location <laughs> that's because google maps works in i think it works to the nearest uh 30 yards because it uses uh-huh. gps so gps only works to the nearest um uh, yards i'm talking i'm talking yes. old fashioned thing. only works <laughs> to the nearest sort of three or four meters so if you're so what happened and and this is where we have a whole generation that actually can't read a map or, or read a chart because so they rely on the gps and they don't understand that the gp so your gps coordinates can be three or four meters off your google chart can be three or four meters off so and the postcode or the direction can also be slightly off because it hasn't got exactly where it is so therefore you can be when it says you've arrived you can be actually half a mile away from where it is not because anything you've done but because you don't realize that the the combination of the gps and where it's saying that it is on on the actual chart and where it thinks it is can be completely different to where it is actually on Uh. on the thing 
Now I know so, why I'm always just out. Yeah. And then I walk around in circles yeah. going, where is this place? And normally I'm <laughs> determined because I'm going to get a massage or get my nails done or it's somewhere like that that I have to go. I'm not going to give up. But it frustrates me. And now I know why. So thank you. Yeah, it's it's and and one of the one of the things to do with that is to say so, so if you're going for a massage, you say right, where, where's the biggest shop, and and work back from the biggest shop. So say is there a Tesco's or something that I can find? Because Tesco's is normally because it's a bigger area, you can find that 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 will actually coincide with where the GPS thinks it is on the map. Ah. Whereas the massage places and that don't normally are right. normally can be two or three streets away from where they think they are on the map. So you can often say, where's the Tesco's? And then when at the Tesco's, which way do I walk from there? And draw, draw yourself a little map. When, when they're talking to you, you draw yourself a little map. Because I do lots of cheats, me. I, I do tons of... It. You should see how I've prepared for this interview. I've got your questions up. I've got my dyslexic thing up. I've got my uh, how, to, how to attach to a po podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I just so have like, to say um, for our listeners out there that are in Australia, Tesco's is like a Coles. Oh, so, sorry, right, yes. Yeah, no, that's okay. <laughs> I mean, this, these podcasts are listened to internationally, but for Australian listeners, I love a good Tesco's when I used to live in the UK. Yeah. Um, so that's a good tip. Thank you. And, and one of the important things is you, as a dyslexic, you instantly go to blaming yourself that you're the one who's wrong. And that's what we dyslexics do all the time, and I do it all the time, and my, mm. my other half picks me up at it. Because we all automatically assume that we are wrong because we're dyslexic, because we've been trained by the media and by our logical system at the moment. We are trained that dyslexics are always wrong. And actually, most of the time, I would say we're not. <laughs> I like that. Thank you. And now I definitely know I'm not wrong. It's Google Maps. <laughs> <laughs> Can you talk to us a little bit about, because we were talking about your chunking before and you got your license, pilot license, and then you decided to um, follow in the footsteps of Amy Johnson, who is a true aviation hero from the UK, and she flew solo from in London through to Darwin. So how did you end up becoming inspired by her to do follow her footsteps in the air as such? Um, so I started reading. I, I am a, an avid reader, but I read a lot of, uh, I struggle with all of the manuals that are white on black, but I do read a lot of old books. And of course, as I say, the old books are normally on sort of yellow paper. So I started reading and I had a flight in a Tiger Moth, which is the airplane that I fly, um, my, my airplane, but I had a flight in one years and years and years ago and I fell in love with it. And I thought, ooh, what did these aeroplanes do? And I found out that they worked in the war uh, to train pilots. And then I found out that between World War I and World War II, there was all these mad, heroic people flying around the world in these paper-thin aeroplanes made out of, you know, fabric and wood. And they were discovering that you could fly all around the world. And they did amazing adventures. But the ones that I was reading about always started with, Lady uh, Mildred Bruce, Lady Mary Heath, Sir Alex Henshaw, the Duchess. And I thought, okay, that's fine. So I put all these books down and just read them and thought, that's great. And then I read a book about Amy Johnson. And Amy Johnson wasn't titled. She didn't have massive amounts of money. She had a second-hand aeroplane. She got sponsorship, although I seem to fail, fail mahusively on the sponsorship side of things. It's very hard but to she get. Was <laughs> very hard sponsorship. I would have yes, thought you'd yes. have a lot more chance of trying to fly a plane than I've had for my projects. But... <laughs> oh, no, it doesn't seem to. I don't see. But what one person? I, I, I digress, which is what dyslexics do all the time. One, but I went into one meeting and they said, "Wow, it's a fantastic presentation." But Amanda, you always seem to just do it, so we're going to let you just do it. And I was going, kind of "Oh afraid. no." <laughs> <laughs> I was kind of like, what? Um, but yes, yeah, so I read about Amy Johnson and suddenly this woman who came from a uh, secretarial background, you know, she, she was a secretary. She then went on to be a legal secretary and she'd just fallen in love with flying and absolutely loved it and became an engineer like my dad. Uh, my dad wasn't an aeroplane engineer, but an engineer. And I suddenly thought she was an ordinary woman. I'm an ordinary woman. And she just did an extraordinary thing. Maybe I could do a little bit of an extraordinary thing. And I seriously 
that was it. I read the book and I went, Ooh, how could I do that? And I went back to chunking it. Okay. So how do you get sponsorship? How do you get an airplane? How do you uh, plan it? How do you get permission to fly across? Cause it's in, in those days, you didn't actually have to have a lot of permission. Mm. There wasn't any airspace. You just flew across countries. And I went to speak to a couple of people that had done it who were very, very kind and gave me their knowledge. People like um, Polly Vasha, who, who flew down to uh, Australia, has gone twice around the world, once around the middle and then once she tried and attempted pole to pole. And I went to speak to all these people and I realised actually money, yes, you, you do need money. And I throw all of my money at it, which is why I sit here in a jumper that's got holes in it. But actually what you, what you really need is a passion and a persistence for it. And I am nothing special. I absolutely assure you of that. I am nothing. There's no magic to me. It's pure Churchill blood, sweat and tears. And that all it is. It's just, I went, that's what I want to do. That's what I'm going to do. And I'm going to put one foot in front of the other every single day to try and make that happen. And that, yeah. and Amy did that. She did that. And she was this amazing person of how she did it. And she did it in much shorter time than me. She did it in the space of six months. It's taken me 15 years to do it from, the, from when I read the book. And, and she did it in 19 days. And I only got to Beirut in 19 days, which I thought was quite, quite spooky, really. But um, when I had to stop at Beirut, but that was what it is. So she motivated me because she wasn't, she wasn't anything special and she didn't have masses of money behind her, which proves, and I'm the same, it proves that people like you, me, us, dyslexics can go out there and do amazing things. That's if really just, inspirational. Yeah. So, and that, that, that was what it was. I just went, you know, sometimes I think I wish I hadn't read that book. I might have had some nice holidays and give me choose by now. <laughs> well, I do think that about the foundation sometimes too. I joke about when am I going to end up being able to buy my Louis Vuitton wallet. It's a, become a running joke now in my family. Because <laughs> all your money goes into your passion. <laughs> oh, well, now you see, this is one of the, the good things about what's happening at the moment, because there'll be a lot of people wanting to sell those for quite a lot of discount. <laughs> so so we, might, we, might be, we might be good. <laughs> we might be good. We'll have to exchange when we finally get, get our piece of yeah. designer that we're looking for. <laughs> yeah. Was it um, scary flying solo in a vintage aeroplane? Like, that's really brave to do that. It looks like it's really brave from somebody, from a point of view when you don't fly. But I'm not very good in water. And I had to do the, what they call wet drills. I had to do, uh, you have to every so often go and train and make sure you can put a life jacket on and get into life raft and all that sort of thing. And I'm not very good at that. And jumping in and putting my life raft in, I said to the to the instructor, "You're going to have to push me because I'm just I'm just I'll be stood here for for two hours on the side." So I'm scared of that kind of thing. So again, it goes back to your strengths and weaknesses. For me, flying in that tiger moth is peace. It's calm. I'm actually more nervous now talking to you in case I make a mistake than if I'm up there flying because. I don't know what it is. It, it is. it is my world. It is my, it, my calmness. It, it's every time I leave the ground, I, I just get this feeling of calm and, oh, yeah, this is it. This is where I, I, I belong. And so, I wonder if it's because you, you, can't be, you, can't, you can't be contacted. I wonder if it's because <laughs> the only thing you can do when you're flying is flying. You can't multitask. You can't do everything else. You can only fly. And I wonder if it's also that 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 I love about it. And I love looking out the window and therefore, I, I suppose I got nervous sometimes of various things, but because I've been doing this a long time and I've trained a lot for it, it sounds really weird. I just felt disappointed when I had engine failures. I <laughs> can was imagine the documentary. <laughs> if you were working towards the goal for 15 years, I mean, I've been in the yeah. foundation for four and you know, I have big dreams for it. So to last 15 years and to be able to visualise that goal and to be able to work towards it is just amazing. So I can see how you'd be disappointed if you landed in Beirut and you're on your way to Darwin. Yeah, yeah. It's, um, it was a combination of 
the uh, Iranian sort of the Persian Gulf and the security um, guys that my other half is in touch with back here in the UK said, you're going to be shot down. And that is when I got scared. So I'm not scared flying. But when they said to me, if you fly down that, that particular bit of water where the drone was shot down, where the American drone was shot down two weeks later, you're going to be shot down. That I was absolutely petrified for. And that is why I stopped and turned wow. around and came home. <laughs> because I thought, I don't want to be shot down. I'm really... People look at me being brave. But one of the bravest things was actually going, was saying I was dyslexic as a pilot. Because you're, you're closing the doors for various people that don't want to think dyslexic pilots are, are not very good. So it's, it's that, again, it's that strengths and weaknesses. And I would, I know I keep saying it, but to all the dyslexics out there, you, you know some of your strengths and keep pushing at those and find somebody else to do your weaknesses. <laughs> yes, Sorry. like my mum, as everyone knows, it's my mum that does all my editing. But um, I just so you know, you haven't made any mistakes and you're doing a fabulous job. It's wonderful oh, talking you. to you. Um, there are no mistakes on our podcast. A lot of people said to me, oh, you failed because you only got to Beirut. And I, and I was planning to go to Australia. And of course, I was downhearted. But Beirut is an amazing place. And they are an amazing set of people that they've gone through a living war. And they're now struggling even more with what's happening at the moment in the world. Mm. And they are such an upbeat uh, section of the world. Whereas, you know, there's a lot of people now sat in their homes going, oh, I'm, I'm bored, you know, and you're kind of like, really? <laughs> <laughs> But so failure and success. So a lot of people turned around to me and said, oh, you failed because, and, and like you say, you spent these 15 years doing that and then you failed. You only got to Beirut. And I went, did I, did I fail? I'm probably the only person that's flown a tiger moth down the Alt Pass, which is through the Carpathian Mountains. And it was a blue sky day with the little white fluffy clouds. And these mountains have snow on the top of them. And there was a person that came formation with me and filmed me flying down here. And it was one of the most beautiful sceneries that you've ever seen and it was calm and it was lovely and it was absolutely amazing i've done you know i've flown across the mediterranean twice now by myself in a tiger moth in a 75 year old airplane and yes i didn't make it at this attempt all the way down to australia but i will do and the the, the amazing things that's come out of it so one of the things that that we've ended up speaking about this so when I landed at Sibiu in Romania, uh, which wasn't a place where Amy Johnson did, but I'd been invited to go there because there was a gastronomical event, which was terrible for the weight and balance. But um, <laughs> I went there and one of the people contacted me before on Facebook and said, my daughter is dyslexic. She's struggling. She would love to. She's drawn you a picture. She would love to meet you and present you this picture. Would that be OK? And I'm even getting I always get emotional about this. Um, so Irina drew me this absolutely wonderful picture of me in the uh, tiger moth. I'll send it to you afterwards. Mm. And she presented me this picture and she's a dyslexic girl who's struggling at the moment. And I thought, wow. And when I'd spoken to other people who've done these kind of things, I sudden, you suddenly realize, and you're one of these people, you are making a difference. And that is an incredibly humbling and incredibly brilliant thing to do so yes I might have failed in the fact that I didn't get to Australia but my god I failed so spectacularly I might have changed one person's life she might go on to believe that she can succeed in whatever she wants to do just because we met and how is that a failure and that's the whole point of being able to share stories like yours and so people can see that you know it doesn't matter what background or how much money you've got or how much money you don't have or whether you finished school or whether you didn't, that you can achieve something if you, yes. if you want to, if it's there for you and you can visualise it like you did for 15 years. Um, yes. You know, we can achieve amazing things in our lives and your story is just so fascinating to be able to share. And it was interesting before when you said that uh, it was harder disclosing that you were dyslexic and you felt that was yes. more brave. Can you share with us a little bit about what that was like and why you ended up disclosing? It was basically the um, arena. She, she was the one that I thought, what do I, when, when I started on this, on this um, adventure, I thought, what do I want to do this for? Because everybody said, oh, 
the way you get sponsorship is to do it for a charity. And I do support quite a few charities, but I didn't want to just, it just sort of looked like I was doing it for, for those reasons. So I decided to do it for different awarenesses and dyslexic awareness uh, for women in aviation and breast cancer awareness uh, and STEM, which is the science. Let me get this right, because uh, acronyms, of course, you know, <laughs> the science, technology, engineering and, and math, as my dad used to say. You know. um, and I, I realized that by doing it as awareness, because in Beirut, they've got a massive problem of people that are dyslexia that there is no state sort of uh, I think they I think they recognize dyslexia but they don't get any help they don't they don't get any um, you know sort of uh, being helped with anything over there so there are people out there doing uh, charities to help the dyslexics learn to read and get jobs and I thought wow that's an amazing thing to do so I'm I'm selfishly flying my airplane across the world doing what I want to do as my dream which is what I've, I've always wanted to do and, and I've been very lucky to keep being persistent and make it happen but if I can then help other people on the way and as I say it, it's not to sound big-headed but actually it's an amazing thing to do and it's a humbling thing to do and when, when I'd first uh, started in the job world I went along to one interview and the guy said oh, I, see, I, I see you're dyslexic you know um, how's that going to affect you sort of thing in, in the office world and I said well I, I just need a yellow thing across my computer oh well we can't do that and I thought okay that's interesting um, and now of course you're not allowed to say that, that those kind of things in the interview mm. but it made me the people would react differently to me if if they thought I was dyslexic they thought I'd they thought now I'd, I'd, I'd have the sort of virus, you know, that it was almost like that, that they reacted to you as though they could catch dyslexia. Well, tough, you can't have it because it's my ability, so you're not having it. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, so, yeah, us dyslexics, us dyslexics rule the world, by the way. Did you know this? Because yes. most, most, most of the people that run the governments and that are normally dyslexic. They're normally, they're normally the big thinkers, the dyslexic. Because, of course, they're not linear. It's mm. the big picture people. So we are the people that are in the world. But we have to not tell the non-dyslexics this. So, um, but I, so I've had, and I had a, an awful lot of bullying at school. And I had an awful lot of stuff. I go back to my parents. My parents were wonderful. They were the ones that kept sticking by me. They were the ones that kept instilling me that if you have this love for learning, you will find your strength and you will find what you like to learn and you will find your your place in life and now as as i did i, I sort of tapped on the dyslexic you know dyslexic awareness but when irena came up and gave me the picture and and we're still in touch now and when i had this picture drawn you know from a dyslexic it's a very nice picture i thought wow do you know what it is very important and now throughout this year I've had so many people uh women and men who have messaged me privately and said I'm so glad you're doing this because I've been dyslexic and I've never told anybody and I've done this and I've done that and all the rest of it and there's so many dyslexics out there who don't tell anybody and I can understand why because you do get bullying and you do get treated differently and you do get people looking at you differently and it is quite tough to be able to stand up and say, yes, I'm dyslexic and I, uh, it's an ability, not a disability. And, and if you don't have people that are surrounding you with love and sort of taking you forward on that, then that's quite difficult. And so therefore, maybe you and me now have this ability to give that to other dyslexics and say, look, you don't have to tell the world, but you can tell us and we'll say, you know, that's amazing because the people that have been contacting me and saying, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm an engineer and I've been and I've been making things for 50 years, but I've never told anybody I'm dyslexic. I mean, that's quite a quite an amazing thing, really. It's sort of. Yeah. So, yeah, it really is. And I'm in my research I'm doing at the moment. I've been interviewing um, adults with dyslexia and the number of them that haven't disclosed the for multiple reasons is it's hard to listen to their stories and you know the reasons why people don't want to disclose it it's everything that you just said um so if we're able to help the, people have a voice 
a lot of jobs in the aviation world will not want me because I'm dyslexic because they think it will impede my ability to read a checklist. And I might not read a checklist perfectly, but neither does the pilot sat next to me who isn't dyslexic. That's why we have checklists because none of us read checklists perfectly. That's the whole point of the checklist. And actually I now say as a dyslexic pilot, because I have this, uh, the, because my brain works in pictures, I'm more spatially aware of what's going along. It helps me with my navigation and also it helps me with the big picture. So when things go wrong in the airplane, I don't have to, yes, the checklist is there, but I can also use other informed stuff of how the airplane flies and what's happening to help with that rather than um, just know that checklist off by heart. But of course, uh, people will, people, you know, there's a whole raft out there that will just say, no, we're not having any dyslexic pilots. But the amount of pilots who have told me secretly that they are dyslexic as well is quite, is quite <laughs> astonishing. So this is the thing. And, and this is the whole point. I think it's, and the lady that helped me at, at school right at the start, and, and, and she's the one that I should be sort of doing it in memory of now. She was very upset that throughout this age, and again, I go back to the fact that because it, it's, we're very linear and on computers, it's all very linear. Uh, and we have to learn ABCD. And that's how we learn at the moment. Whereas before we learned in pictures, if you go back at about a hundred years, it was all pictures and it was all people telling stories and that's how you learnt. So therefore it's just at this point in time that we're having this sort of uh, dyslexia is a, is a bad thing. Whereas actually dyslexia is an amazing thing because you, you can, uh, to, uh, and, and normally as a dyslexic, you've had to think outside the box. Mm-hmm. So you've normally had to, if, if, you, if you're a successful dyslexic, you will have lots of tips and tricks. So I've got my yellow on my computer, my other half set up the Zoom for me. I've got the, uh, I've, I've written down uh, the points that I wanted to say. And, I, and I've got those as, as in, in big, bold letters so that I'm not struggling to read it. All that kind of stuff. So lots of tips and tricks that we've learned outside the box, rather than just being told, this is how you learn A, B, C, D, and, and just relearning that. We actually have taught ourselves how to learn. So that's where, but I think because it goes against, because you can get bullying in the workplace still, and you can get a lot of people um, saying they don't want dyslexics. I've, I've, I made that conscious decision that I thought, no, I'm going to go public. I'm going to be the dyslexic pilot. That's one of the things I'll be known as, and hopefully that will help other people. And I don't care if people don't want me because I, I realise now I'm very Marmite through all kinds of things, dyslexia, breast cancer, being a woman in, in a man's world, all that kind of thing. I'm very Marmite and you either, it's either you, you, you love or dislike me. And so I'm now concentrating on the people that like me and, and love me and want me to succeed and trying not to worry about the people that dislike me. I love Doing that you, that you are Marmite, Marmite. Cause I was like, I wonder where you're going with this. For those that don't know what Marmite is, it's like Vegemite in Australia <laughs> and you Vegemite, either like yes, it yes. or you don't yeah. like it. And I yeah. love that, that there comes a point in your life where you can say, I'm Marmite. You're either going to like it, like me, or you're not going to like yeah. me. And that's okay. Yeah. Well, one of the things dyslexic try and do, they always try and work on their weaknesses and they always try and work where they're not liked. And, it, and again, that's one of the things that if you, if you can sort of come away from that and go where you are liked and work on your strengths, you'll find that life gets easier. It'll be interesting to see now that we've moved to this world of working from home and everything is online, whether yes. um, there will be a better place uh, for us in the workplace where we become more accepted and the work environment is more adaptable to how we need it to be. So it's going to be interesting to see over the, next, the coming months I think it will because you know I, I can have my yellow, um, my yellow um, pages on my on my computer. I can have it on night time because it's slight gives me a slightly yellow screen. I can you know have the uh, music playing, all that kind of stuff. So yeah, I, I think it's going to be very interesting. So you uh, mentioned briefly before that you're writing a book and it's about from failure to success. Can you share a little bit about uh, your book with us? So the, the, the book at the moment is the Solo to Darwin first attempt, uh, which, which will end, end in the 
having to ship ship the airplane back <laughs> um, and having the engine rebuilt but my uh, the first book is um, Confessions of a Lady Pilot which I didn't actually put that I was dyslexic in it mm. and to, to this day yeah and and because that was at the time where I wasn't saying that I was dyslexic so it's quite interesting but I and and I somehow need to go back and figure out how I can book you know in the second edition that I can put and dyslexic in it and it wasn't actually it wasn't something that I consciously did but I realized I unconsciously didn't sort of shout that I was dyslexic at that time but it was a very light-hearted look at, at, at being a woman in, in a man's world and flying the tigers but actually that book has been the stepping to this book and the solo to darwin first attempt has a lot about the uh, the breast cancer because of course when i had breast cancer that tried to kill me more than actually any kind of having an engine failure and that was actually my biggest point i turned around and thought blindly well if breast cancer is going to try and kill me then i definitely need to um somehow have a go at flying from australia to uh, from england to australia but the and hopefully i'll be saying things about the um i am saying things about dyslexia in the book as well and it's and it's very much a this is how i did it this was you know the flying side of things and as as i say when when i do a talk you know if i can you can and it's that thing of failure and success and failure and success is the same coin and the more you succeed, the more you fail and the more comfortable you have to become with failure. And that isn't, a, that isn't an easy thing to do. And I still struggle with that every single day uh, with failure. My other half, who's typing away there quite loudly, will, <laughs> will attest to the fact that I still struggle with the failure side of things. But it is true. The more you succeed, the more you fail. And you have to go through the failures to succeed. So it's part of that, part of that sequencing, part of that journey is what everybody uses. But it is, you, 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 as I say, and if you can turn around and learn and go, what, why did that fail? And what went wrong? And for me, the reason I had to stop at Beirut is because I was going to be shot down if I went further. So that to me was quite a good stopping point and going, oh. okay, I don't want to fail in the fact that I don't want to get shot down. So I'm going to come back and uh, do, it, do it another time. And now we've got um, uh, coronavirus and all other things getting in the way. <laughs> so yeah. actually it proved that it was the perfect time to do it last year. Mm, so all the people right. that said I failed, I go, yes, but I completed something about my dream probably more than you did. And now have you got the opportunity to do it? So hopefully in this book, um, I, I'll definitely be shouting that I'm dyslexic. It will have the dyslexic ability uh, course um, sort of where to go in the end of it as well. And at some point on my to-do list, <laughs> I will go back and make sure that I put I'm dyslexic in, in the first book, which is Confessions of a Lady Pilot. And, and everybody loves that because, as I said, I, I spoke that one more. I, I dictated that one and then had that translated. Um, and this one, I'm doing a combination of dictating it and, and writing it at the, at the same time. So, How yeah. do you find the dictation? I was in, in university. I was one of the first people that trialed Dragon Dictate, uh, sort of, you know, all those years ago in the Middle Ages. Um, and it was somewhat successful and somewhat not because you had to train it to your your voice and your mm. speaking. And it's it's a technology, so therefore it's never going to be as good as somebody translating it. So I use a combination of all kinds of things. I, there's, uh, for, for the first book, I sent it away to be translated. I actually just spoke it and then sent it away to be typed rather than trying to use uh, a dictation side of things. I find them hmm, probably 50% useful. For, for me, what I use them for is jotting down a lot of notes and jotting down the order of how I want to say it. And I do it more as a talk and then I go back and take from those notes and then try and write better sentences from that. So, but as I say, the first book, if, if, if you read the first book, everybody says to me, oh, it's just like sitting down and having a conversation with me. And I went, oh, funny you should say that. Because <laughs> it was. And, and I think you'll see a, a difference between the, uh, between the two books of, of, of how I've actually grown and got better as, as a writer 
And that's through the documentary, actually, because you have to do a lot of, and, and, and you, you, you'll know this, you have to do a lot of publicity stuff. So you have to go, oh, dyslexia ability is amazing, and I'm amazing, and everything's amazing, and you have to write as the third person, which is really quite a strange thing to do about yourself. Yes, um, when, when you're doing it all yeah <laughs> so you're doing it, so it's like oh it's amazing and, and you know and, and, and you're kind of like scratching your head and thinking Where, where's my publicist writing this <laughs> but um the documentary guys are great because it's been uh, filmed by a company called give get go who has the mantra of giving people that wouldn't normally have the chance to get going in the film industry so when we sat down and chatted and I said I was dyslexic, uh, he's not dyslexic, but the producer, but we had this whole big thing of helping people and that. And I thought, wow, that's amazing. And this is one of the things that I must keep reminding of myself is the more I do these things, the more you actually attract the good, the good stuff um, in. And as I say, so, and, and, and the more failures you get, <laughs> but also the more successes you get from it so yes the, the, the dictation sometimes it helps sometimes it, it's um yeah I'd, I'd love to be able to just have a person have, have, have a secretary just typing it for me <laughs> oh yes me too that is my one of my goals in life that one day I will have my own secretary that's not my mum <laughs> our mums are amazing aren't they <laughs> oh, I'm so blessed I really am I'm very very lucky your story yeah. has been so amazing to um, listen to today, Amanda. Thank you so much. Is there anything else you'd like to say uh, before we leave um, to any of our listeners out there encouraging young dyslexic females in particular to be brave and males to be brave and to follow their dreams? <laughs> yes. One of the really sobering things is that I think we're having a higher rate of suicide in young men. Um, and quite a lot of them are dyslexic, which is just horrifying. Mm. So that's the worst case scenario. So please don't think of your dyslexia as a disability. Think of it as an ability and try and concentrate on your strengths. I know the world tells you that you have to learn to spell right and you have to learn to get your grammar right and you have to do this, you have to do that. And you will find when you read my book, the spelling mistakes, the grammar mistakes, all, all, all the stuff in there. So nothing has to be perfect and believe in yourself and I know that's difficult and I and I have to do that every day you heard one of my alarms going off which is telling me to believe in myself and don't let the gremlin swing and have that seven o'clock moment allow yourself to give in but never give up and honestly if I can do it I am the biggest I'm the biggest failure and success on the planet so therefore if I can do it you can do it and you need to find find help and I think you're right you know your Facebook page and all that kind of stuff if you're not finding the support in the people next to you then go and find the support in the dyslexic world because there'll be a, a, a huge amount of people there that will take a time to get back to you because it's all on written stuff but they will be there <laughs> supporting you <laughs> so that's what I'd, I'd like them to say and, uh, and yeah n never give up you, you do you do have strengths just tapping into them well thank you so much it's been such an inspirational podcast i'm feeling really inspired after being locked away for three weeks in my house so <laughs> thank you and you know you're all you're nothing but success definitely in my eyes there is definitely no failure so thank you so much for sharing so openly your story and uh, for all of our listeners out there all of amanda's Fabulous information. Her books will be on our website so you can follow her story. And if you are planning to another trip to Australia, I hope I get yes. to be in Darwin to wave you in because that would be just awesome. Absolutely. Absolutely. You'll definitely be on the invite list. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's just Thank been you so much, a joy Jane. to talk to you. And you take care during these times and uh, hopefully we can chat again soon. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for inviting me. If you'd like to find out more about Amanda and her amazing adventures, head to dyslexic.com. Amanda was also a guest on our Q&A series, Question Dis. Each month, I interview a fellow dyslexic about all things dyslexia and life. The Question Dis series is running through Facebook Live. I really hope you can come along and join us for one of these sessions. If you haven't already done so yet, make sure you sign up to our mailing list so you can keep up to date with everything we do at the foundation. Head to deardyslexic.com. And don't forget, if there is anything you've heard today that was distressing, please call Beyond Blue 
on 1300 22 46 36 or Lifeline on 13 11 14. If there is a topic you would like discussed on the show, please email us, admin at dyslexic.com. I hope you've enjoyed today. Bye for now. Uh.